My number three game of the 2010s is Alpha Zero versus Stockfish. Now, when the initial 10 games were released, waking up was like Christmas morning. All of a sudden, I had 10 new chess brilliancies to look at that had not existed in the chess world before that day. In addition, the rise of neural networks has been a revolution in this last decade as it's introduced new styles of play, stronger play, and a whole new barrage of strategies into chess. One could easily pick multiple Alpha Zero games or Leela games for this top 10 list, but I'm going with my favorite, the Queen's Indian defense game in which Alpha Zero just strangles Stockfish on the dark squares. The game opens up with a lot of opening theory in the Queen's Indian defense, which is actually quite surprising because Alpha Zero is not depending on opening theory at all. It's making up its own theory, and sometimes, as in this case, it's coming to the same conclusions that humans have. In this case, it really likes this pawn sacrifice line in the Queen's Indian defense, where white is willing to give up this d5 pawn in return for active peace play, good pawn structure, open lines, and a lot of pressure on this long diagonal. Alpha Zero won multiple nice games in this Queen's Indian defense line. Continuing here, we're going to zip through this further theory. The queen is going to swing into f5 over here, putting some pressure on the king side, and white is able to expand with e4. That keeps the d pawn backwards, and in general, the pressure on the d file and on these squares is one of the things that's white's, that white's really working with in this position. Pawn g6 pushes the queen around, and again, we're going to see some maneuvering. I like the e5 move because it's locking in on these dark squares, Actually, this whole e5 locking in on d6 and f6 is a massive theme throughout the entire game, so it's worth taking note of this moment when that structure was created. The queen slides away from the knight's attack, and rook e8 is actually the first novelty in the game according to the chess.com database. Everything else up to here had been played before. Now knight c3 is wonderful because you're focusing on some lovely squares for the knight. Queen b8, the knight hops into the beautiful d5 square and the bishop falls back here. Uh, bishop f4, queen c8, h3, an interesting move, not really much to do, so alpha 0 decides to push the pawn over here and just keep the bind. In general, alpha 0 is going to play with an extremely unhurried style in this game. White has a positional clamp and seems to be able to kind of do whatever White wants in this game. There's no hurry to win tactically. Instead, you're just increasing the bind and just tightening the screws a little bit with each move. It's really, really instructive to see this sophisticated positional kind of play. The knight uh, falls back to e3, bishop c6, and now a really nice maneuver, rook d6, right into the throat of the black position, knight g7, and then rook to f6. Love this, and this theme of control of d6 and f6 is making itself felt in the game. Queen to b7, bishop to h6, knight d5. We get a trade here. And then the other rook mobilizes. The rook play is really wonderful in general. And we're going to get a trade on f8 here. Now, it is really, really interesting to analyze computer games between Alpha Zero and Stockfish because the rating here is over 3,300, probably over 3,400 for both players. There were some criticisms that Alpha Zero or that Stockfish wasn't optimized properly for this match and maybe it could have played better. Uh, if its settings had been improved, but still it seems like Alpha Zero is the stronger engine and in any case the play is just really 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 high level. There are no big tactical blunders in these games. Instead it's all sophisticated positional play so we're not seeing like oh I think this was an improvement kind of stuff. It's almost impossible to improve on the play. The improvements are really in the details and in the other understanding of the position. That said, I think that this is a position where white has a clear advantage, even though the evaluations from the engines at this point don't agree with that. I think that white has the better pieces and the control over these holes in the black position really does matter. White also has targets and black does not. If it were humans playing, I would think it's a clear plus. The fact that it's engines playing doesn't really change that. I think it's still a clear plus for white.
So continuing on queen h4, uh, we're going to see the queen slide into those dark squares further. Rook a to e8, rook d6. I love this position. White isn't really any, uh, even threatening anything yet in this position, but just look at this occupation of these dark squares. I think the exchange of the bishop on f8, I'm not sure if there was anything better, but that might have been a mistake on the black side. So bishop takes f3 at this point, bishop takes f3, queen to a6. And now I'll mention that rook takes d7 was possible, but this seems to give the black queen some activity, tickling the rook in the b2 pawn, rook d2 to defend the rook in the b2 pawn, queen c4, you get some attacks, some checks. White is losing the bind a little bit. Um, and in general, once you take the d7 pawn, now you have to worry about black getting access to the open d file, and then black's rooks can finally breathe. As long as you don't take the d7 pawn here and instead you keep your rook back, then what are these rooks doing? They're really not doing a lot and your rooks have a lot more potential. So I think strategically, taking on d7 probably is a mistake, although it doesn't really show up in an initial computer evaluation. Instead here we get the move pawn to h4 from alpha zero. I think this is really instructive. One of the themes that came up with Alpha Zero's play when it was carefully reviewed by Matthew Sadler in his amazing book Game Changer is that Alpha Zero loved to push the H pawns and just wedge them into those H6 and H3 squares in the opponent's position. There are a lot of reasons for that that Sadler goes deeply into, but one is that it's just going to tie the opponent down, bottle up the king, and often create mating nets. Um, and in end games too, when the king gets bottled up, sometimes you can just win because the opponent's king is out of play. So there's a lot of interesting reasons to push the h pawn, and we see that start here. Now queen a5, and then rook back to d1, stopping any queen e1 check business. Rook um, to d1, sorry, and then uh, pawn c4 here, rook d5, queen e1 check, the king moves to g2. We're going to get c3 trading off a set of pawns here, and now pawn to h5, again the h pawns making its way up the board right here. Of course, black never wants to take here, that wreckage of the structure is just going to be a disaster. So rook to e7 in this position. Now I think we start to get really clear and incisive play from alpha zero from here to the end of the game. Bishop d1, great maneuver. The bishop's not doing anything on f3, so it's going to swing over to b3, where it will put a lot of pressure on this diagonal, leading to the f7 pawn and the black king. Now queen to e1, and the bishop completes its maneuver, going to b3. Uh, rook over to d8 here, and then the rook slides back to f3. It no longer needs to be on the f6 square, so it's going to maneuver to put more pressure on the opponent's position. Now in this position, queen e4 is forced and black does play it, and I want to discuss briefly why the move queen e4 was forced. In this position, if you make a nothing move like a5, which is not the best nothing move, but okay, a nothing move, then h takes g6 is a win, so black had to defend against this. The problem is first off, if f takes g6, we finally do get a cool tactic in the position after rook takes d7, well you can't take with the rook because this is checkmate, or queen there is checkmate, the knight on e6 is pinned right here, see how useful that bishop d1 b3 maneuver already is turning out to be. Also, if you... um. After rook takes d7 here, if you take with the other rook, then you're leaving this hanging, so bishop takes e6, and this is also checkmating. And after h takes g6 here, if you choose to take uh, with the h pawn, sorry, I'm getting my moves mixed up a little bit, the problem is really, really nice. The rook is going to get to the h file in this position, and that's going to win. You can start with rook e3, pushing the black queen around, and then you go rook d1, and the idea of rook h1 and mates in here is devastating, and white is winning in this position. So all really nice stuff. As a result, after rook f3, queen e4, helping defend on this diagonal and tie down this rook, is the only move in this position. So now we get queen to d2 here queen to g4, and the queen just came back to d2 so that a moment later we could push this pawn to h6 and we get that, you know, bone in black's throat that we were talking about, this idea of h4, h5, h6. We wedge a pawn into the h6 square and we really confine the black king. We create mating nets and more. 
Now after pawn to h6, we get knight to c7 here. The rook slides into d6, and this is really instructed because this rook d6 move that was set up by h6 is going to, in just a moment, sacrifice the pawn on e5 here. So alpha zero, having built that advantage on the maintenance of the pawn on e5 and then control over the dark squares on d6 and f6 is willing to sacrifice that really critical pawn on e5 in this critical moment after finally you know getting this pawn into h6 it's interesting and at this point basically thanks to the remaneuvers that um, alpha zero has done you can give up this pawn and still maintain control over the critical squares uh, which i think is just super super instructive from a strategic point of view now rook d5 happens and here i think that stockfish is probably going to make the losing mistake although again it's really hard to know because we can't trust the computer evaluations here if the queen falls back to c7 maybe white is better even according to my version of stockfish here um, although black is up two pawns Every piece that white has is doing great work here. So this might be a position where white is better, but it's hard to say that this is a position where black is lost. So if uh, Stockfish had played this way, it would have been really interesting to see how the game turned out. Instead, after rook d5, we get the move queen to h8. And I think that queen to h8 is just a losing move. The queen will never get out of this h8 um, square from here on out. We get queen b4 tickling this rook on e7. Um, if the rook falls back, then queen a4 is really strong, going after these two pawns, winning a pawn, and maintaining a really strong position. So knight c5 happens, moving the knight and blocking the queen's attack on the rook. And boom, rook takes c5. One of my favorite positional moves of all time. We get an exchange sacrifice here with very little material on the board, and after the exchange sacrifice is accepted by force, you get queen to h4. Brilliant. After queen to h4, we're intending to bury the queen here um, on this h8 square. We're attacking the loose rooks, and we are crushing in this position. I should mention here that if you try queen to e5, getting the queen out and also defending this uh, loose rook here, then you have a few good options for white. One is just rook e3 here, but you can also take on f7 because you're loose over here as well. So there's some nice tactics in this position. So queen to h4 here, the rook moves, um, the other rook moves over to defend e7, and then we get in rook to f6 now this queen is never getting out here on h8 and white is just going to support that rook with uh g4 and g5 there's also pressure here on f7 so honestly we're going to play through the rest of the game and it's instructive but this is just a winning position strategically even if your computer is not yet appreciating that, appreciating that this is just over so rook to f8 here, queen to f4. We see that g4 and g5 push. Black throws a pawn on d5. It doesn't change anything. We're going to take it. The bishop just pulls back to c4. I'll mention here, if you go rook d4 trying to make a nice fork, then white has both bishop takes and rook takes on f7. I like rook takes f7 best. And then after the queen is accepted, rook g7 is a beautiful double check and checkmate in one. Wouldn't it be nice if the game had finished that way? If it was between humans, I can kind of think that maybe black would have allowed this checkmate, but computers don't necessarily have that sense of aesthetic, so it's unlikely that you're going to see a computer allow a checkmate like that. Now, pawn to a4, g5, locking in that rook, and eventually the queen's going to have to give herself up for this rook. The rooks can't move because they're tied to f7, so white has the run of the board, and this position is over. a3 gets picked off, and Stockfish says, well, I have to give up the queen, but that's not going to save the game. Now white is up material and still has a big bind in this position, and after pawn to a4, um, I'm not really sure how it works, but either the engine threw in the hand and resigned based on some resignation programming, or the engine's operator resigned in this position, but um, my version of Stockfish is showing plus 25, and I think everyone can see now that this is over. Um, what a game. I love that game. It's a brilliant mix of strategy and tactics from Alpha Zero. I had to pick one Alpha Zero game. I hope you like this one. We'll have to look at some more Alpha Zero games later on. 
If you like this game, be sure to check out the playlist that's sitting on top of the board that has the rest of my top 10 games of the 2010s. And as always, you can like and subscribe to help support the channel and the content.